like his much more recent response to hoaxers, in which he states that claims like yours are nonsense. Unlike you, I have no need to quote, I have mine. No need to quote, quote mine. mine, quote mine. You obviously don't watch my videos much. I do show this statement. It's difficult not to, as Rene made no secret of the fact that he was in communication with Dr. Van Allen. The original Geiger counters had been overwhelmed by an enormously high level of radiation. Subsequent to my writing the book, he retracted. Gee, I wonder why. Mm. Ain't that strange? And I used to talk to write him and say, look, for Christ's sake, you're getting older by the day. You want to die with this shit on your conscience? And now he says, well, maybe we made a mistake. Geiger counters don't make mistakes. Geiger counters don't make a mistake. They sent up one Geiger counter, and the further up it got, the radiation picked up right away, and it kept getting more and more and more, and then it shut up. Mm. And they couldn't understand that. Finally, some guy on his team says, hey, let's... Let's take another one and let's shield it to the point where it starts, where this one quits and see what happens. They did that, and I never did find out where the second one quit, or if it didn't quit. But one is enough to know you're in hell. What the hell do you think they make the friggin' things for? Mm. Imagine it bypassing one and going into a second one. But that's not deadly radiation, no. In any case, thank you for supplying us with this letter. As you can see, it offers no reconciliation for the redoubts he got from the Raccoons, Explorer, Pioneer, Sputnik, and Lunar spacecraft. In fact, he doesn't even mention these experiments. Any newbie reading this letter would think he never made those claims to begin with, which pretty much confirms what I've been saying all along. He swallowed his words and offered no explanation for why his readings told him the radiation was deadly. Why should I take as gospel a statement made by someone that offers no reconciliation whatsoever for what he previously stated? Do I trust the murderer's I didn't do it claim when he previously confessed to it and even provided the murder weapon? If you want to hear the only modern statement that Dr. Van Allen ever made on his original work, read the October 1997 issue of Media Bypass. Professor James A. Van Allen, now 83, is Professor Emeritus in Geophysics at the University of Iowa. Our first question was why he did not speak up after NASA's claims and defend his original findings. Astonishingly, he told us that his seminal Scientific American article in 1959 was merely popular science. Are you refuting your findings, we asked? Absolutely not, he answered. I stand by them. In the next breath, Van Allen acquiesced to NASA's point of view. He became positively mercurial in his answers. Basically, he defended NASA's position that any material, even aluminum without shielding, was adequate to protect the astronauts from the radiation he once called deadly. When we asked him the point of his original warning about rushing through the belt, he said, it must have been a sloppy statement. So, you stand by your original statement, Yet you call your statements about deadly radiation sloppy? Where's the logic in that? Considering the results of many, many satellites, space probes and raccoons that Van Allen sent into the belts, not to mention the results from the Soviet missions that confirmed the American results, and the fact that modern satellites must operate outside the belts to protect their instruments, are we to believe that all of these results were merely a sloppy statement? Anyway, since there was a measurable risk, that's why the Apollo missions were planned to skirt around the worst parts of the Van Allen belts. But you already know this, don't you? The idea that one can avoid the radiation of the Van Allen belts simply by steering around them using the trajectory that Apollo allegedly took seems to have gained popularity within the propagandist crowd. So it's worthwhile spending some time with this one. Yes, the belts are thinner towards the poles, and there is less radiation there, but it's still far from safe. As Kovalev tells us in his 1983 article, the dose rates at the equator are 11,666 rem per hour, and this dose rate decreases towards the poles to be as low as 312.5 rem per hour. But 312.5 rem per hour is being generous to the Apollo astronauts, as this dose rate applies to astronauts on a ship with an inclination of 90 degrees. 
American spacecraft usually launch with an inclination of about 30 degrees, in which case the dose rate would be 667 rem per hour. In case anyone tries to deny that Apollo's alleged translunar trajectory had a 30 degree inclination, let's remember what Windley wrote on his site. Each mission flew with a slightly different trajectory in order to access its landing site, but the orbital inclination of the translunar coast trajectory was always in the neighbourhood of 30 degrees. Stated another way, the geometric plane containing the translunar trajectory was inclined to the Earth's equator by about 30 degrees. A spacecraft following that trajectory would bypass all but the edges of the Van Allen belts. Propagandists don't deny that astronauts would have taken an hour each way to pass through the belts. Given that the maximum doses of radiation one can receive before dying is 500 rem, that means the astronauts would receive 1,333 rem, or 2.6 times the lethal dose in the belts alone. Hopefully, this puts the 30 degree inclination trajectory argument to rest. Was Van Allen correct when he said, The discovery is of course troubling to astronauts. Somehow, the human body will have to be shielded from radiation, even on a rapid transit through the region. And so they were. No, they weren't, as I pointed out earlier. Astrophysicist John H. Malden writes that aboard a spaceship with two meters of water shielding, the doses within the Van Allen radiation belts will be reduced to one rem per day, or 0 0.041 rem per hour. Is this true? I'm sorry to have to disappoint you again, but I'm not qualified to answer that question. Nor do I know the context in which it was made, or its relevance to the Apollo missions. Now, if he was some hero of mine, or if I had made dozens of videos pushing his ideas, then you might be justified in asking me. Unlike you, I have no need to quote, quote, mine, mine. quote mine. That's a pretty nice collection of space exploration books you've got there, Jera. Why don't you sell them to someone who can appreciate them? At least you admit that you are not qualified. And since you ask for the context, here it is. John H. Molden proposes a starship with two meters of water shielding, surrounding the living waters to protect its occupants from solar, cosmic, and also belt radiation. Naturally, his theoretical moonship would need to traverse the Earth's radiation belt and the radiation belts around the other planets belonging to the stars they would visit. On a starship, there are many ways to receive low or high doses of X-rays and other radiation. Any nuclear reactors, fission or fusion, radiate those who must work near them and those near the shielding. Planets with magnetic fields have belts of trapped energetic particles that must be traversed to leave or reach the planet. Near Earth, the dose is about 1 rem per day. Some stellar objects, unlikely to be visited soon, emit intense energetic radiation. Solar or star flares of protons, an occasional and severe hazard on the way out of and into planetary systems, can give doses of hundreds to thousands of rem over a few hours at the distance of the Earth. Such doses are fatal and millions of times greater than the permitted dose. Death is likely after 500 rem in any short time, whereas 500 rem spread out over a lifetime is not likely to cause trouble, although is not clearly safe. NASA has suggested astronauts might tolerate about 200 rems if received over several years. While cosmic particle radiation provides less total dose, the higher energy can cause many kinds of secondary particles flying through the starship after the primary particle is stopped by thick shielding. Cosmic particles are dangerous, come from all sides, and require at least two meters of solid shielding all around living organisms. Earth's atmosphere provides the equivalent of 10 meters of shielding. By comparison, solar flares can deliver GeV protons in the same energy range as most cosmic particles, but at much higher intensities. 
Increase of energy accounts for most of the increased radiation danger because GEV protons or their products will penetrate several meters of material. Jay Windley claims minor solar flares can't hurt you. Is that true? I have no need to quote mine. Quote mine. J. Warren Keller, quote mine. quote mine, Russell D. Shelton, quote mine, quote mine. Martin O. Burrell, quote, quote mine. mine, and James A. Downey III of Marshall Space Flight Center, quote, quote mine. mine. Wow, five false accusations of quote mining. All state that minor solar flares can take anywhere from 2 centimeters to 36 centimeters of water to reduce the dose to 25 rem per hour. Is this true? I have seen where Jay Windley makes such a comment, and taken in proper context, it is essentially correct. For astronauts, shielded the way the Apollo astronauts were, minor solar flares are virtually harmless. Virtually? As in, not entirely? As for the other four you quoted, four people who your hero, Ralph Rene, would call heavily credentialed gas bags, and yet he cited them, praised them, and used their research as factual. Your vast knowledge of your opponent's work is really starting to show. First of all, I'm not sure I would accept your translation of their findings, as the term give off more than 25 rems per hour does not sound very scientific to me. Funny, because as we saw in the previous question, John Molden used the term too. Would you prefer if I used the term deliver more than 25 rem per hour? When you need to attack someone over trivial wording like that, it only demonstrates how weak your position is, not to mention how pedantic you are. Secondly, I don't think you have any idea what their findings imply, and you don't have a clue what that graph represents, as far as hazards to astronauts. Unlike you, I have no need to quote mine. I have mine. no need to quote, quote mine. mine. Quote mine. Nice logic there. You blindly accept what Windley says as factual, but when a group of scientists say something contrary, you dismiss it as quote mining on my part without a shred of evidence. Just so that there is no doubt as to my understanding of their research, let's have a look at this graph. The x-axis for this graph represents water shielding given in grams per square centimeter. The y-axis represents the radiation dose. These curves on the graph represent individual solar flares. The closer they are to the right-hand side, the more water shielding is needed. The higher they are on the graph, the more radiation they deliver. The lowest dose on the chart being 10 to the minus 1, or 0.1 rem, and the highest being 10 to the 7 rem, or 10 million rem. Now the unit for radiation dose is given in rep, not rem. However, the authors state that substituting the rep unit with rem is not far off at all. Two pages earlier, we find, Contrary to what might be expected, much of the radiation encountered in solar proton outbursts appears to reach the vicinity of the Earth in isotropic distribution, thus necessitating protection from all directions. Figure 14.5, taken from Source 5, shows one set of rough upper and lower estimates for the integrated dose as a function of water shield thickness for low energy flare events of August 1958, May 1959, July 1959, the intermediate energy event of November 1960, and the high energy event of February 1956. While the dose is given in Rentgen equivalent physical, REP, the RBE for high energy protons is close to 1, and therefore the units may be considered as Röntgen equivalent man, REM, with little error. However, these curves consider primary radiation alone. Some estimates for the secondary problem for such flares have been made. This line across the screen represents 25 REP, or 25 REM. If the curves go above this line, the flare delivers an excess of 25 rem. If it drops below the line, the flare delivers less than 25 rem. 
This graph shows the low energy flare of July 1959 and the low energy high flux flare of May 1959 would both require 31 grams per square centimeter of water just to bring their respective doses below 25 rem. Without this shielding, the dose would be quite unpleasant to say the least. And these are just minor flares.